The advice and opinions expressed by the host of Autism Live and her guests are meant solely as suggestion and should not be in any way construed as child-specific advice. The Center for Autism and Related Disorders advises working with a board-certified behavior analyst who has experience with autism before starting any intensive behavioral intervention. Any choices you make in determining your child's treatment are completely at your own discretion. Welcome to Autism Live. I'm Shannon Penrod, and we are webcasting to you live from the Center for Autism and Related Disorders headquarters in Tarzana, California. So thrilled to have the opportunity to be here with you today. We're going to be with you live for the next two hours talking about autism and how we can be more effective, more efficient, working with a child on the autism spectrum, working with a teen or a young adult on the autism spectrum, and for those of you who are on the spectrum who are tuning in, helping you to also to overcome obstacles that you're encountering in your life. And to be honest, really, we're, we're trying to help all of us, whether we're on the spectrum or not, to overcome obstacles so that we are more efficient, more effective in everything that we do in our lives. We talk a lot on this show about ABA, Applied Behavior Analysis, and using the principles of ABA to help us to overcome those challenges that we all face. The things, you know, getting better at the things that we're good at and shoring up the things that we're not good at so that our skills are more in line with the kinds of things that we want to do. But it's by no means the only thing we talk about here. We talk about the emotional aspect of autism. We talk about uh, the funding aspect because, you know, no conversation about autism would be complete without talking about overcoming some of the financial issues uh, and everything else that goes along with it. Uh, we like to think that we present a 360 degree view of this, su this subject, this topic. Now, I would tell you though that we can't really accomplish that without your help. Uh, there are so many different aspects to this conversation and we look forward to getting your input. That's, this entire show is meant to be interactive. We love it when you tell us the kinds of things that you wanna see on the show, ask questions of our experts that we have here with us, uh, propose different topics, even say, I don't even know what to ask. Whatever input that you guys wanna bring, we really enjoy it. And if you, I I haven't said this in a while, but if you're interested in being on the show, you have something that you want to say and you want to be on the show, we can Skype you in so you can be at home in your fuzzy slippers and be on the show. Please, if you have ideas that you want to present yourself on the show, you can submit those to us. Emily is going to start to cycle through some of the different ways that you can get a hold of us here with a question, a suggestion, a request to be on the show, any of those things. Uh, if you have a product or a book that you want to talk about on the show, there is a way that you can go about submitting to us to let us know. And, uh, and we can hook you up with being on the show. Um, I'm going to get to this in a minute. But take a look at the different ways that you can get a hold of us. And I want to remind you that there's only one way to watch us live right now. And that is by going to www.autism-live.com. When you go there, you see a desktop. And we're adding more and more information to the website. But there is the website. And when we're, it, the show streams 24 hours a day, seven days a week there. Um, but there are 10 hours a week when we are live. If you were on the East Coast in the United States, we are live from 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. If you were on the West Coast, you want to adjust the time difference there, so it's 10 a.m. to noon, and everything else around the world, I count on you to do the math because you know more about which time zone you're in and which time zone you're not in. Uh, and I know at different times of the year, it makes a difference when we're on daylight savings. Ah. Um, but in any case, find the time uh, that we're live for you, and when we're live, there's a box there it says that we're we're live right now and it says questions that we're answering right now you can type whatever you want there and hit enter and it shows up magically here on my screen and I can then fair your answer to an appropriate person potentially you know give my two cents on it for what that's worth and there's no need to log in there's no credit card information we don't even know what your name is and that's well, the great thing about that is that it's that, that instant gratification the more challenging thing is if it's 
something you want us to get back to you with, then you will need to give us your information either through email or you can put it on that live feature. I get to filter it before I post it for the whole group. So if you want to put an email address or your name or whatever it is, you can and I can. I have a way that I can filter it and not give out your private information. So there we have it. Uh, all those different ways to get in touch with us. And by the way, I want to mention that there is a new way that you can find and watch our show. We're always looking for ways to hook you up with our information in easy to use uh, instant ways. And we are now on the Autism Speaks Network, which is an app that you can get either on your Android device or your Apple devices. It's free. Love that. Very important to us to be free. And you can download that for free. And not only will you be able to watch our show and different parts of our show, there are only a few segments of our show up there right now, but there'll be more coming. But you can also catch episodes of other shows that are autism based, our sister shows, we're calling them. So definitely check them out. They all have different areas of interest. Very exciting for us to be involved with the Autism Speaks Network. All right. We like to start every morning with something that we fondly refer to as the jargon of the day. This is when we take on one word, one phrase, one acronym, and try to make heads or tails of it as it relates to uh, the individual in our life that we know that has an autism spectrum diagnosis. Sometimes these words are sneaky because we've heard them in other contexts and we think, oh, I, I think I know what that is. Perfect example is generalization. You know, I believe it was last Friday that generalization was our jargon topic of the day. And I was talking about that on the, on the show about, well, you know, this is a word you've seen before, but you may not know how it relates to autism and how important that is. And oddly enough, I went to my son's school that afternoon and was volunteering in his classroom. And there on the board was the word generalization because it had been their word for the day, but they were talking about it in the more typical use of it, that people make generalizations about other people. Uh, for us, uh, you know, and I think sometimes making a generaliz generalization is considered, you know, not the best thing. Uh, but for us, generalization is a huge watchword. It's so important that our kids generalize skills to other skills. Um, perfect example of, of a word that has a new meaning once you're in the land of autism. Uh, today's word, I think, is a little bit guilty of the same thing. So let's take a look. Our, our word for today is hypersensitivity. Now, uh, we probably have heard this, phrase, this word before in conjunction with a great many things that you might say that somebody is uh, you said something in, uh, to them and you say, oh, well, somebody is so hypersensitive when you talk about their kid or or you, talking about a child having a hypersensitivity to a medication or something like that. But how does this relate to autism? Let's take a look at our actual definition, which is extreme or abnormal responsiveness to external stimuli. Okay. Uh, and then let's take a look at our actual or our working definition, which is having a response to something that creates challenges. So imagine for ourselves that uh, you and I go to a concert and it's in a venue that's very small and the band is really, really loud. And there's 150 people who are in this club that are listening to the concert and maybe some of them are struggling with how loud it is, but they're able to be there, right? Uh, maybe there's somebody who says, man, you know, it's making me uncomfortable. My chest is pounding with this. And they're saying, you know, I'm going to go one step over. I would say that that would, I would think everybody would be a little bit sensitive to it, right? But it's on a scale of, you know, what is the sensitivity to it? But then there's somebody else who is absolutely debilitated by it. They have to be in a fetal position. They can't even make their way to the door to go out to help themselves because it is so, they are so sensitive to it, it's debilitating. It stops their ability to function. And they're not even able to help themselves at that point. We would certainly say that that is a hypersensitivity to either the bass or the sound or whatever, whatever aspect of it is. Our kids are sometimes really hypersensitive to things in their environment. And boy, you know, let's guess as to, you know, what it could be. Um, 
my son is, uh, and the way that they react to it too, full spectrum of things. My, I'm hypersensitive, I think, well, I don't know if I'm hypersensitive, I'm sensitive to loud noise. I really can't cope as well as everybody else can, but I can, in most instances, take care of myself and say, I can't do this, and walk away from it and make that choice. Um, and was able to do that even as a small child, to say, this is making me uncomfortable and to move away from something that is aversive. So I would say I'm sensitive to it. My child in the moment, we can be someplace and it can be really loud, really loud, to the point where I'm uncomfortable and he appears to be appears to be perfectly fine. But then when we go to the quiet environment, after the loud environment, he loses it just loses it. And when he was a child, he would lose it to the degree where there was no consoling him, there was no getting, no distracting him, no getting through it, no going on. Everything had to stop. And over the years, we, you know, it took us a little while, honestly. Um, and I don't know why it took us a while, because when he was six weeks old, the pediatrician called that. We could take him everywhere at six weeks old. We took him to see his first movie. We took him to see Finding Nemo when he was exactly six weeks old. And he sat in his little car seat, you know, cradle thing and watched the whole movie, sat there, eyes open, didn't sleep, watched the whole thing, didn't cry, didn't mew, didn't, you know, he... Uh, I, we were able to give him some milk while he was uh, while he was doing that. I, you know, uh, to TMI, but pumped breast milk, and you know, so he was thrilled. He was just absolutely thrilled. We left the movie theater, and he cried for like four hours. And we went to the pediatrician and said something is horribly wrong. Well, what happened before? The pediatrician wants to know. See, just like us, what was the thing that happened before? And we said well, we took him to a movie. It's too much for him. <laughs> he said, this is going to be a child who has the reaction afterwards. Oh, I was told in six weeks, it still took me a while to get that. Um, cause I didn't, I didn't quite get that the baby was having a hard time with that, which meant the toddler would have a hard time with that. I kind of thought he was going to grow out of it. And you know, really he hasn't grown out of it, a phrase that really tears my ticket right now, uh, cause some of the things in the news, he didn't grow out of it. We worked him out of it to the point where we look at it and go, all right, what can we do beforehand? What can we do while we're there, while he's there with big noise? And what can we do afterwards to help him to self-regulate? Um, and so we talk about it before, about when he starts to feel funny that we're going to pull back from, you know, we, we do a whole social story about that. Uh, while we're there, we kind of monitor the behavior and make sure that it doesn't get too loud for him or make sure that he's got earplugs to kind of keep it under control. And afterwards, we don't put big, de big, huge demands on him and we give him a period of quiet time, um, all of us a period of quiet time to sort of de-stress and come down from it. Uh, you know, all those things are very important so that sometimes when I'm not there now at school and something is very loud, he has skills to help himself. I don't think that, um, uh, you know, maybe he's not as hypersensitive to it, but I think he's still sensitive to it, but he has skills to manage it before it gets too bad. Does that make sense? Uh, in any case, Imagine all the different things that your kids might be hypersensitive to. They could be hypersensitive to a cold drink, to a hot drink, to the sensation of crunchy foods. They could be hypersensitive to smells. They can be hypersensitive to people talking too fast uh, or uh, fluorescent lights or having a tag in the back of their shirt or having um, shirts cover the lower half of their arms um, to a certain kind of scratchy material to water being too hot or water being too cold, all kinds of things that they can be hypersensitive to, too much light, not enough light. Um, the list is endless. We don't just say, oh, well, that's it, then they're hypersensitive. When they're hypersensitive, it really means that they're disabled by it. And we need to work on that. And, and there are things that we can do by looking at, okay, what can we do beforehand? What can we do while it's happening? Can we minimize the exposure of this? Because some things you can't. You know, if your child is very, uh, 
sensitive or hypersensitive to fluorescent light bulbs, then of course you're going to try to limit that to some extent, but you also need to teach coping skills because what, is your child never going to go into a grocery store in their entire life? They're never going to go to school. You're going to say to the school, you got to change the fluorescent light bulbs. You know, you might, you might, and if it's that devastating and that's the thing that you want to focus your energy on, you could, um, but there are so many other things to focus on as well. You know, you might be focused on getting the aid trained appropriately to deal with your child and your child's other behavior that you don't have time to ask them to retrofit the fluorescent light bulbs or to bring in area lighting, right? It's all about picking and choosing your battles. And it's about helping our kids to be able to overcome their obstacles. And this is a huge obstacle here if they're hypersensitive to something. There are things that we can do to help. We really want to consider bringing in professional help um, and, and being cognizant of the things that they're hypersensitive of and trying to help them with them. Really super duper important. Okay, we also in the, every morning like to have a question of the day. Question of the day meant to get you participating and we have been talking about the subject of compassion all week long. Yesterday we asked when have you truly felt compassion and it was almost like we could hear the crickets here in the studio. <laughs> you all liked the question but not many of you had an answer to it, which, you know, I can understand. Uh, but today we're focusing on what will you do today to show compassion? That our whole thing this week and, and moving on to our, our topic of the week has been uh, compassion. And not only that, compassion in action. So we've talked about compassion all week long and hopefully you've been stirred to do something that is compassionate already. But today we're really asking you, what are you going to do today to show compassion? And remember that this can be compassion towards yourself, this could be compassion towards your child. This could be compassion towards your significant other, to your child's teacher, to your parents, to your siblings. Who can you show compassion to today? And, and like I said, it could be you. There's nothing wrong with that. We want to show compassion to ourselves. We can't ask people to do things that we're not willing to do ourselves, right? And we want people to show compassion towards us. So we should be willing to show it towards ourselves. So what are you gonna do today to show compassion and who are you going to do it towards. We're going to be checking in with you a little bit later on and I'm excited because I know anytime we ask those open-ended questions of you guys, it's amazing the kinds of things that you guys come up with. And I do think, I do believe that we have these uh, positive, assumptive, supercomputer brains and when we ask the right question, our supercomputer brains will give us the right answer. And when we ask things like, how can I be nice to myself today? then generally something really good and positive comes up. We don't think to ourselves, how can I be nice today? Uh, the answer that comes up isn't, well, you know, I can fail to exercise and overeat. That isn't the answer that comes up, right? <laughs> right? It just doesn't. Uh, but if we ask ourselves, you know, why do I always feel crappy? You know, we will get an answer that says, well, we always feel crappy because, you know, we, you know, we deserve to feel crappy or something like that. Um, so ask yourself the right question. What can you do today to show compassion? And I'll look forward to seeing what you guys have to say about that. But we are talking about compassion in action all this week. And really, we're today is February 1st. And we're on a little bit of a timeline here that for the next 60 days, I want to get ready and I want all of us to get ready to celebrate World Autism Awareness Day, which will be on April 2nd of this year. We're only 61 days away from that. No, 60 days away from that. And uh, I don't know, I can't do the math. <laughs> it hurts my head. But in any case, uh, we're, we're that close. And I know that like a lot of you, I, I, I love the fact that we do World Autism Awareness Day, but there is that part of me that goes, but this is an ongoing thing. I, I know for what we get a day, but really for those of us, it's every day, right? And, uh, and so I kind of want to honor that myself. Uh, by showing compassion where I can because on April 2nd, I really want to ask the world to turn around and show compassion to our kids.
and to us, to all of us in the autism community, because this is no small thing, right? And uh, so I want to gear up towards that, you know, what we say about our kids. If we model the behavior, we're much more likely to have the success in them completing the behavior. So let's model the behavior for the world. Let's be an army of people who have compassion for ourselves, for our kids. We show the, the world this is how you show compassion to individuals on the spectrum. But even bigger than that, that we show compassion for the world so that when we ask for the compassion, we're in a place where we're ready to receive it. And to that end, on March 1st, exactly one month from today, I will be shaving my head here on the show to show compassion for an individual that has been, uh, has come to my attention, a young man who has brain cancer with a small child um, and, the, and their family has just been devastated by this. And it's a story that's touched me. And um, I, so I will be doing, uh, my primary reason for that will be to show him compassion. But in the course of doing that, I wanna encourage all of you to show compassion in the way that's appropriate for you. And maybe we can raise some money um, for the things that you want to show compassion towards, whatever those things are. So we'll be talking more about that. And you'll want to tune in because I am going to shave the head, the full. Somebody was asking me, are you talking about just a buzz cut? Are you talking? No, I'm talking about bald, 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 bald. Really looking forward to it. Uh, <laughs> and we're going to see some different interesting things that we can do for that. If you want to do a fundraiser, write to me and tell me what you want to raise funds for and how you want to do it and how me shaving my head could potentially help you. Like, for instance, if you want to say to your community of friends, hey, there's this crazy woman who's going to shave her head, and if I can raise X amount of dollars and you tell me how much it is, you know, I'll work with you on this. If you need to raise $500 so that you can get your child an iPad, you say, I'm going to do this with my friends, and you will write my kid's name on your head if I can raise the $500 on your bald head and magic marker if I can, I will do that for you. Um, but be creative. Like, that's just an idea that I can think of. How can I help you uh, by shaving my head to have your own fundraiser? Let's think outside the box. Let's see what we can do. And I'll look forward to hearing from you guys about that. And if there's something else that I can do to help you to raise money for the thing that you need to do. And of course, I always encourage you that if, you, if you're if you okay and raise some money for ACT Today, because they'll get iPads to other kids. They'll get fences to kids who need it. They'll get medicine to kids who need it. It's a cool thing. All right. Uh, some of the things that we're going to be talking about today, we have a funding tip for you. Kind of gave it away already. Um, but our guest today, our special guest that we're going to be joined by in just a minute, and I've gone over, and so she's probably standing by waiting patiently, is Kathy Konevsky from Autism Speaks. I read you a really long letter yesterday from a wonderful mom talking about how much Autism Speaks has helped her on this journey and what it meant to her to go to the walk. You know, if you watch the show, I have talked about going to the walk and how much it means to me. And Kathy's going to be talking to us. She's the vice president of, uh, they're, they're uh, creating new chapters and, and taking care of chapters. I think we're going to ask her about that. But so she's going to be here talking about that. And a little later today, we're having the Temple Grandin giveaway. We're giving away the book. We're giving away the cow, both of which are signed by Temple Grandin. So exciting. I have loved having them on my desk, but I'm ready to send them to to a new appreciative home. We have all the names of all the people. You can't see, but there's just this thing is chock full of people who have entered our contest and I'm very excited. We're gonna pick on the air live. And I think we're also, because it's Friday, gonna treat ourselves to watching Temple Grandin's TED Talk, which I like to show from time to time because it's just so inspirational. Um, okay, just in a little bit of a funny mood this morning. It's Friday. We can be in a funny mood. It's all right. Okay, so we're going to take a break and we're going to come back with our very special guest, Kathy Konevsky of Autism Speaks. Stick with us. Currently in the United States, one in 88 children is affected by autism. One in 88 means something different when your child is the one. Recovery is possible. Hi, I'm Shannon Penrod, host of Autism Live, an online show about autism broadcast by CARD, the Center for Autism and Related Disorders. I'm also the mother of a child with autism, my beautiful son, Jem. You know our old joke, guess what? Chicken butt. Chicken butt. So we're going to take the chickens. But things weren't always so easy. I remember when Jem was first diagnosed with autism. I used to lay awake at night in bed 
and pray for someone or something that could help us to get our child back. My prayers were answered by Dr. Doreen Grandpichet and the Center for Autism and Related Disorders. CARD treats autism and other related disorders using the principles of ABA, Applied Behavior Analysis, which is the only scientifically proven effective treatment for autism. It is also recommended by the American Academy of Pediatrics and the U.S. Surgeon General. About a year after we started treatment with CARD, we were able to see tremendous improvement, and we got our child back. What grade are you in? Second. You are a smart cookie, huh? Mm -hmm. Do you like school? Uh, yeah. Do you have any good friends? Yeah, Oscar. Oscar is your best friend? Yeah. And my child is just one of thousands to benefit from CARD ABA therapy. Across the nation and around the world, children are making amazing progress and being given the keys to unlock their full potential. We are extremely grateful for the amazing job CARD has done in helping our daughter. Our daughter today, just in four months, I think is a totally different child than when she started with CARD. I kind of see it as, it, it seems like her brain in a way was asleep and now that we've gotten so many services, um, we've seen her wake up. Did you have some gases? <laughs> Recovery is possible if you take the right steps, um, if you're willing to put in all the hard work and seven and a half years, yeah, it's, it's a lot of work. It's worth every little bit and um, CARD's been there with us every step of the way. I have two children with autism. I can't imagine a day without CARD or the therapists. Um, they've been so instrumental in helping us with our kids and, and shaping their lives and helping us help them. Thank you, Christy and Big Alex. <laughs> Thank you, Jackie and Mariana. We've tried other things before ABA, but the most beneficial thing has been ABA services, and I'd be the first person to tell any newly diagnosed family that you have to you have to contact an ABA provider. And if you're lucky enough to have CARD, you're very blessed. Recovery from autism is absolutely a possibility. We've been recovering children for over 20 years. It's just a matter of identifying the child's medical needs, understanding the child's sensory issues, and then teaching the child all of the skills they need in order to function normally. We know there's hope for autism. Autism is treatable and recovery from autism is possible. Welcome back. We are uh, still getting Kathy Konefsky on the line, but while we do that, we had a question that came in and it's something very near and dear to my heart that I really wanted to address. So on your screen, you should see right now, if you're watching us live, I'll read it though. Hi, Shannon, would it be possible to have a show about the pros and cons of full inclusion for our kids in public school? Right now, my child is being pulled for all reading and math and works in the resource room two hours each school day. This is the second year he's done this. I just never know if I'm doing the right thing and suggesting less time in the resource room. Uh, my intuition tells me he's being overly supported and not challenged enough. If you could share your experiences with selecting full inclusion for Jem, I would be thankful. Oops, and I just marked it. Uh, ah. Sorry, I said it was answered complete and we haven't even answered it yet. Um, in any case, uh, I actually we have a, a full week coming up where we're going to be talking about inclusion in April. So I want to cue you into that. And during our uh, Autism Awareness Month, we have a full week on inclusion. But I also, yes, let's take a minute and talk about it right now because there are I always like to say that it's we can never give child specific advice because it would be a disservice to your child and to you because we can't know everything just by what you guys say and, and what you send to us. Having said that though, it's always interesting to me to hear the parent's perspective and, and what I hear and what I think you stated very clearly in there is that it's your intuition that there's too much support. And I am a huge fan of parental intuition. Yes, sometimes we're not right because we're responding to old stuff, but I, I'm going to go out on a limb and guess that in this instance that your intuition is probably spot on. And 
and encourage you to encourage the team to, to wean off of that amount of time in the resource room and to ask them to take data supporting why they think he should stay in the resource room if they do and, um, and take data on how he does when he goes into the classroom. And there's lots of different things that you can look at to see, to measure how he's doing. Um, and not just measuring during the time that he's there, but how he is for the rest of the time. Because I don't, I don't know what the rationale is for why they want to have him in the resource room. Um, there are certain schools of thought, when we talk about the pluses and the negatives of inclusion, um, there are certain schools of thought that say, you know, if we're going to minimize the sensory issues that we have to combat while we're teaching, introducing a new subject, that I have heard people say this is a reason to be in the resource room. Okay. All right. And there may be some validity if we have a child who is extremely hypersensitive to some sensory issues in the classroom. That if, you know, if they're sitting between two kids and the other kids have issues and, and you've got kids that are whispering and doing things that are, and it's hard for the child to be able to attend when the teacher is teaching, uh, introducing something new. Now, you know, I will say as an ex-classroom teacher that there's a little bit of that that I go, mm, okay, all right, that might be the case, but why are we penalizing the kids and, and saying we're going to take you out of the social situation and we're going to put you in this other social free environment and hope that we can teach it to you there when there are modifications that we could make to keep them in the best possible and i am a fan of inclusion i don't think it's possible for all kids i really don't and for me as a as a parent of a child on the autism spectrum and as a former teacher sort of where i draw the line is if the child is going to be a danger to themselves or to others boom there's the line and after that, to me, if they're not a danger to themselves and if they're not a danger to the other children, then they should have an opportunity at inclusion because that's where they're going to get the interaction. I think that sometimes we sell our kids short when we say, oh, well, let's put them all together in one little room. Where's the modeling there? It totally cuts off. In fact, we, we leave room for the fact, I know for my child, this isn't true for all children, but when my child uh, is somebody, oh, and thanks, I see that what you just wrote. My child is somebody that he is, he notices what other people are doing. And if somebody is stimming next to him and rocking and, and hand flapping, my son's going to be sitting right there next to him and doing it. He just is. That is who he is. If you set him next to the kid who's paying attention and listening, my child can sit there and pay attention and listen. And by the way, how I found that out was before he was even in preschool and he was in the first early intervention while we were waiting to get ABA started, uh, he was in a room full of kids who all had different issues and my child couldn't do it. He, oh my, you want to talk about hypersensitive. My child could be locked down in a weighted vest with a blanket and there was too much going on because all these kids had other things going on. He could not do it. And the, it was during spring break that that one of the other kids, his brother, his older brother, who's neurotypical and was like five, six years old, came with him, sat next to him in the classroom. And for the first time, my, my kid sat in the chair, was very trying to communicate with the kid, couldn't speak. He was nonverbal at the point, but, you know, looking at him and trying to sit next to him and then started doing all the little signs that the other kid was doing because they would, they would do these songs where they would sign all the different. And the teacher looked and said, oh, my goodness, what happened? What did you do? And I said, nothing. He sat next to a kid who was able to do it. And from that moment on, I fought for inclusion like a crazy person. But that's my kid. Um, you know, and my child, first of all, there's a resource and then there's pullouts for other things. And I think it is, I think of it as being different. I suppose that there are professionals who wouldn't. There are times when they would pull my son out when he was very little for certain things. Um, a little bit for OT, like 15 minutes at a time. Drove me crazy, hated it. I don't know how, like logically it doesn't make sense to me. Your child's behind, this is what they say to all of us, your child's behind, we need to catch him up. So while everybody else is moving ahead, we're gonna take him someplace else and do something else with him. Excuse me, isn't he more behind now? Seriously? Um, that was just how I saw it. And I, 
I see the difference and I, uh, and not just with my child when they're included. And I see the difference for the other kids in the classroom. And I see the difference when you have a good teacher. And it kind of comes down to that. You got to have a good teacher. You got to have a teacher who's willing. There are people who don't know how to do it. And there are people who do. And you want to make sure we, you know, probably this time of year, you're getting close to when they have open house at school where you get to go in and see what your kids have been working on all year long and they decorate the classrooms. I love it. Go to that. Spend five minutes in your own kid's classroom and then go to the classrooms where they have the potential to go next year. Spend the time there <laughs> and see who the teacher is that you want for your kid for the next year and see how they interact with the parents and see how they interact with the kids. Um, and I see that uh, you said that your child does have a full-time aide. Then I got to be honest with you. I, I want to know what is the rationale. Is your child a danger to themselves or to anybody else? Um, because if it's that there's another kid in the classroom that has the potential to hurt your child, then it's that child that needs to go out, not your child. But if your child is somebody who bites, kicks, spits, and you have done an FBA, have a BIP in place, and you still haven't gotten that behavior under control, then I would certainly make a case for your child has to go to a special room for a period of time while we work on this and slowly get them back into the room. But other than that, I, I don't know. Oh, I'm a big fan of inclusion. If one of our, we know one of the deficits our kids have is social, then why would we limit it? We know that if we give them more and more and more and more and more opportunities, they're more likely to be successful. And especially because you say that your gut um, says that there's too much supervision, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to say the other. Now, you just wrote back in and said to me, my son goes to resource room to work on IEP goals. So every day, the same goals taught in the same way, the same teacher, one-on-one, -on -one, two years now. Um, yeah, we're going to talk more about this because where does that leave room for generalization? Where's the progress? Where's the data that this is working? If it's the same room, same teacher, same thing, where's the plan for generalization? Where is their plan to have your child fully included? Um, but let's talk more about this. We've got Kathy Konevsky ready to go with us. Um, and then I'm going to come back to this because this is important. It's that generalization thing that we were just talking about. We have to have a recipe for success. And if the people who are working with our kids don't know how to do the recipe for success, then sometimes we have to give it to them. So let's stick with us because we're going to come back to this. But in the meantime, we're going to take a break and come back with Kathy Konevsky from Autism Speaks. We'll be right back. Our twins, Justin and Jessica, were premature babies, so we always were very conscientious of their development. But I think it was probably 15 months, Justin started getting really obsessive compulsive with opening and closing doors. And Justin started tantruming a lot too. These would be major tantrums that were just completely debilitating to the family. Having to take them out of the house, put them in the car, drive around just to calm him down. Yeah, I remember a breaking point and just thinking, you know what, we gotta do something, this is not right. Once we were on the track to getting a diagnosis for autism, we started sharing that with our close friends and family. It just so happens that somebody from our older daughter's private school called us out of the blue. She introduced herself and she says, I know that recovery is possible. Those words so early in our journey were a guiding force for us. As we got more educated in knowing what is effective therapies for kids with autism, we realized quality ABA is vital to that progress. That's where we decided that CARD was the right provider for us and for our son. Justin responded very well to therapy. The behaviors were tracked and saw that what was being instituted was working. Justin, what are you doing? You are coloring, good for you. There was real progress and there was progress that was tangible. I just remember when he, he made a sentence, he said a sentence. We just 
happy about it, going, no way, I can't believe you just did that. What's the date? The 18th. 18th of what month? December. Oh, what year is it? 2007. Oh, okay, so how old are you today then? The therapies that Card did for Justin didn't just impact his daily living skills, but it was a positive impact on our entire family. I'm Justin. I am in fourth grade. I like playing video games sometimes. My dream to build a teleporter machine. Like sometimes if like we're on an airplane and it's like really long. You guys just say, oh, hurry up with that teleporter machine. We're waiting on you. <laughs> and I just started Friday Night Lights. This is our third game of the season, and um, it's pretty fun. You have to be fast. We attribute so much of Justin's recovery to CARD. Their goal was the same as our goal. We wanted Justin recovered. June 12, 2008 is a day that I celebrate every year because that is the day that Justin was deemed recovered from autism. And Dr. Doreen Grandpiche met with us, looked at him and just said, he's brilliant. You need to keep his mind stimulated because he's very smart and he has no residual traits of autism. Welcome back to Autism Live. As promised, our special guest joining us via Skype is Kathy Konevsky from Autism Speaks. Kathy, thank you so much for being with us here today. Thank you for having me. I'm so thrilled. And I, and I want to start by having you tell people who you are. You're a mom. You've got three kids. What does autism, what role does autism play in your life? Autism is my life. <laughs> You're right. I, I have three boys. I have uh, twin sons who are 21. Uh, who have autism, so we just are going through the transition into adulthood um, with them and, and for them. And then I also have a 19-year-old son who does not have autism, who is a sophomore in college majoring in special education. Wow. Um, so we are a perfect example of how autism just truly, truly shapes your life um, because my professional life is also uh, devoted and dedicated to autism. Uh, through my job at Autism Speak. Wow. Well, you're an amazing woman and you make an amazing difference. You uh, work for Autism Speaks, but you used to also work for March of Dimes, am I correct? Uh, yes, absolutely. So the twins were actually born four months early. Um, and and I got very involved with March of Dimes with their, um, their mission to give every baby a healthy start in life. Mm -hmm. So the beginning of my career um, after after children um, was, that, was with... Uh, March of Dimes, and, and then I was there for 14 years and joined um, Autism Speaks in 2009. Well, we're so glad that you are working, and you, uh, you're the vice president of the chapter, is it chapter development for Autism yeah. Speaks? Yep, uh, one of our major stra strategic priorities uh, for this year and moving forward is to really start to put our chapters in place and become a chapter-based organization. So that is definitely my focus. Okay, talk to us a little bit about what an Autism Speaks chapter is and what it means and, and why that will make a difference for people. Absolutely, so um, Autism Speaks um, began really uh, to, in 2006 when we, we had a lot of, um, we had legacy organizations that were, were doing wonderful, wonderful work and Autism Speak brought, uh, Speaks brought those legacy organizations together. And what was common to those organizations was a walk program. So we have um, a strong history in a lot of walks and a lot of communities that have um, a really large walk. And that's been kind of the, the one piece of community activity that's been consistent. But now we're growing beyond that. You know, our walks are wonderful, and I'd love to talk to you a little bit about what they do and how they bring our community together. Um, but we're, we're moving beyond that. So the chapter piece actually is, is truly that. It's taking a community, it's putting together a more structured uh, uh, program with the board of directors and, and, a, and it really facilitates so much more activity, both in terms of, of that fundraising component, but also what we can give back to the community. 
um, and we're ready for that. Okay, cool. And you mentioned the walk because, and I, I live here in Los Angeles and I participate in the LA walk. It's an amazing thing. And we talk about that on the show all the time. It's, it's life changing for parents, but you have so many walks. How many walks are there now and how many people total do you have participate? We have close to a hundred walks. Um, that take place throughout the year, and, and about 500,000 um, half a million walkers uh, take place uh, or take Amazing. to the streets. Here. And I've been to the LA Walk, and it is one of our one of our most fabulous walks. But we've got lots of them that are that are so unique and so special. We actually read a letter yesterday. We had asked uh, some of our parents if they wanted to write in uh, to say anything. Somebody wrote in a beautiful letter that I'll have to forward to you guys about the difference that Autism Speaks made in her journey. And she now she participated in the first year that her child was diagnosed in a walk, and then joined the committee. Um, and yeah, and uh, and really a glowing letter, a testament to what you guys do and what a difference the walk makes. And it's something that I respond to because I always say, boy, get yourself to a walk. You you need a mind shift. Get yourself to a walk. It's going to be a fabulous thing. But from your perspective, what are some of the reasons? I don't want to I don't want to hog all the praise, but um, what are some of the things that you are always looking for families to gain by going to the walk? I think first and foremost, it's really um, for, for a new family with, a, with a, a newly diagnosed child or a family that's had a child and with autism for years but just hasn't connected, it's a sense of community. Yeah. I think more than anything else, you take a step onto the grounds of one of our walks and you realize you're not alone. Yeah. And I think when you look at a lot of other organizations and a lot of other walks, because you know almost every charity has one, it's sometimes really hard to... Um, Put a face to that to that cause, and we don't struggle with that. You know, you get you get to a walk and you see a child having a meltdown or just not wanting to be there, and instead of seeing people look at that family like, oh gosh, what's going on there? You see five people that have never met them before reaching out to help. Yeah, and I you leave there with such um, such a sense of, gosh, I'm I'm not alone in this journey anymore. Now, I always, I, I have the opportunity a lot of times to stand on the stage and address the crowd, and I, I ask them to turn to the right and turn to the left, and if it's somebody that they've, they've not met before to introduce themselves, because truly you can bond over a couple of hours and meet somebody that's really going to be important um, to you in getting through the journey together. Well, I, I completely concur. Uh, you know, the first time we went to a walk, that was exactly the thing that hit me as we came into the parking lot and, at the Pasadena Rose Bowl, and I saw that many people. The first thing that came out of my mouth was I said, look, we are not alone. Right. We are not alone, and it, it really was a, a huge mind shift. But what I discovered, because, you know, you hear about the walk, and it's easy to think, okay, well, it's a walk, and it's about raising money and there is a walk and there is money raised but I gotta say there's so much else that happens at the walk that's yeah. so inspirational first of all as you said having an opportunity to see all those people and know how much support and to know you're not alone but there's so much else not the least of which is the resource fair can you talk a little bit about those and yes absolutely because that is I think the most um most unique and the most special part of our walks is that resource fair. So, and, and especially you've been to the LA walk, oh. um, that is just booth after booth after booth yeah. of all kinds of resources and, and community uh, connections for you to make. Um, and so you go, you literally go from booth to booth and, and talk with people and get information and, and leave there with, you know, some, I, I would say a to-do list for yourself, you know, that next week you've got a host of resources and, support um, to make connections with if you didn't make them actually the day of the walk, which I've seen that happen quite a bit too. Absolutely. I, I, I leave with a huge, sometimes two huge bags full of information to pour over and I start getting emails for the things that I signed up for. And yeah. and there were there have been so many times where Maybe I went to walk, I got a piece of information, and I did not need it then, but I have needed it later on, and then be, I keep a binder of all the things I get at each walk, and I refresh it every year, and I can go back to the binder yeah. and go, where is that piece of information I got at that resource walk? It's been so helpful to me. That's the best practice I'm going to share. <laughs> <laughs> I, we... Yes, I, it's a huge zip binder, and I, 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 every year I take stuff out and say, do I need to keep this and put the new stuff in? It's a wonderful, it's like my autism telephone book. It's just great. 
Yeah. But, you know, as we've grown, too, we've actually seen, um, and I'm just going to say some of our larger walks, and that's not really fair. It doesn't matter what the size is. It really matters what the, what the planning committee um, and mm -hmm. the strength of that committee does. But we have seen uh, some separation and, and kind of distinction for new families. So we've got a newly diagnosed tent. Yeah. Um, and a lot of our walks and then an adult services tent. So you, there's something for everybody yeah. along every element of this journey. Um, Absolutely. And I should say last year, within a two week time period, I went to the LA walk and then I had need to be in upstate New York. And I went, I went to the Os Oswego walk um, a, like a week later, and arguably, uh, you know, I mean, the walks are different sizes and different things, and L.A., one of the biggest, and I would imagine that the Oswego one was on the smaller end. Yep. It was just as inspirational to me. I was, you know, in a corner with a bunch of parents, and we were wiping tears away and hugging each other and sharing resources. It, it really uplifting and amazing. Uh, the one that I've been to is always my favorite. <laughs> I'm sorry. The next favorite. My next favorite is right around the corner. I just, there's something special about every single one of them, whether you're standing with yep. nearly 30,000 people or you're standing with 3,000 people. There's just, it is, a, it's just a unique sense of community. Absolutely. So how can, Kathy, how can communities get more involved and how can individuals get more involved? The easiest way for an individual to get involved is to go on our website and right up at the top, it says attend a walk. Click on there and, and look and see because it'll take you to a map of the United States where, and, and Canada where every single one of our walks are. But it's just not our walks. Like I'm saying, yeah. you know, it's starting, it's, it, there's a walk happens once a year. Autism happens every single day of the year. Yes. Um, so we are really building a, a more of a menu of ways to get involved. And you know, Chicago has this wonderful, wonderful program called Community Ambassadors. Um, that when somebody calls the office and says, can I get involved? Um, the answer is yes. And the answer just isn't yes, you know, we'll get back to you. The answer is yes. We have this program called Community Ambassadors. They invite everyone in, and we're actually rolling this out as, as part of that chapter rollout. Um, they, they come in, they train the uh, ambassadors, and we have over 100 people that then go out into the community and share our resources. They share the 100-day kit. They share our transition toolkit and, and sit down with people and really spread that word. So there are ways um, that's just, they're just two, right? So there's, there are ways for people to get involved um, that meet their needs. And that's important too. What do you want to do? Because we'll, we'll have a way to fit what your needs and your desires and your time commitment availability is. Um, that's a so. great, great thing. Great, great service that you guys are doing. Like so many things that you do. I just have to thank you. This is, uh, this is a wonderful, wonderful aspect of our lives, my family's life every year. It's a touchstone for us. We go to the walk and, and, it, and now all these years later, I look back and go, look at how much progress. And I always measure it uh, by the walk. It's a, it's a great, great event, has taught us so much. And, and we really appreciate the work that you do. And, and especially, my goodness, I don't know how you have the time with twins that are 21 years of age on the spectrum and a 19 year old wow. who's off to college. You, I'm, you're a busy lady. I'm a busy lady, but I, I'd love to just say you, you made that comment that, you know, we've come such a long way. Mm -hmm. And for any parent who has had, you know, that age of 21 or wherever that, whatever that age is in your state, because that varies a little bit looming ahead, mm -hmm. we're really worried, you know, that the, you leave the safety net of, of school and that little bus coming around the corner to take your child back to school every single day. And, you know, there was always such a comfort there. My boys have handled the transition into adulthood so well. Oh, so good. I love going to work. They both have jobs, paid jobs. They get on the public transportation. And that stuff was so scary before. And I, I truly, truly credit Autism Speaks for making it not so scary. It's just it's the, the, the opportunities for our kids um, are, are so much more than they were you know, five, ten years ago, and, and that's progress. Well, I really appreciate you saying that. When we were talking uh, with Lisa yesterday and she was talking about uh, the transition to adulthood kid, and I was saying, you know, my son is nine, and, and I was saying, oh, I'm going to need help further down the road, and I know where to go to get it. Right. And, and I love hearing that both of your kids have, that are on the spectrum have jobs 
and yeah. are uh, and are able to use public transportation. I just want to hug you. That is so awesome. And sometime we'll have to have you back on the show to talk more about that because that's amazing. Absolutely. Whenever I'm here. Well, I so appreciate it. So great meeting you, and thank you for giving this this great information. And of course, people can go to www.autismspeaks.org. We talked about yesterday, wealth of information. I really encourage people to go and sp sit down and take a couple of hours and just take a tour of your site. So exciting. And don't wait for that walk date to roll around to no. make that call. Get involved today. All right. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And we'll talk to you again soon. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. So that was Kathy Konefsky from Autism Speaks, and uh, I hope that all of you are inspired, especially after the letter that we heard from a mom yesterday about how much this can really change your life, to have the opportunity to be involved and to be hooked up to resources in that way, really beneficial. We are going to take a break and come back after these messages. Mike warns Jack Riley that he will be allowed to watch the duck song one time only. He does this so Jack Riley can anticipate what will happen once the song finishes. Transitions are difficult for Hammond and others with autism because they have a hard time anticipating what comes next. Because of this, they have a hard time planning ahead and being flexible. These skills are considered executive functions. You guys have to watch this duck song. Oh my gosh! I get turn up music. I get turn sound. And he said to the man running the stand, Hey, bum bum bum, gotta go to the The man said, Look, this is getting old. I mean, lemonades all we've ever sold. Why not give it a go? The duck said, How about no? How about no? Then you waddle the way. Then you waddle the way. Waddle waddle. Then you waddle the way. Waddle waddle. Why not give it a go? Yay! Oh, done. Bye-bye, duck. Bye-bye, duck. Bye-bye, duck. Bye-bye, no. Oh, no. Bye-bye, duck. Later. You know, you know, anger is a cool thing at different times, but not right now. Hey, we'll watch it. We'll watch it again later. Bye-bye, duck. Bye-bye, duck. Bye-bye, duck. I'll miss you. I'm sad. I'm sad. I'm sad. I'm sad. I'm sad. It's okay. Learning how to transition is a life skill. Every day, one is constantly transitioning from one activity to the next, and he needs to cope with changes without tantrums and not be fixated on doing the same activity repetitively. Watching the duck song is incredibly reinforcing for him, and he needs something just as interesting to transition to. Hey, Jack, here's Dad waddle waddling. Waddle, waddle. Waddle away, waddle, waddle. to help Jack Riley transition to the next activity is to count him down. He understands that once she reaches one, that the preferred idol will be taken away. No lollygagging. Five, four, three, two, one. one. Ready? Okay, toothbrushing. We're gonna go like this. Oh. Hey, that's not how we do it. Watch mommy. Can you do that? Do that. One, two, three! Yay! Good job! Yay, Zach Riley! Good, good job! That was pretty good. Five, four, 
four, three, <laughs> sit down. Hi, buddy. Sit down. Three, two, one. Yes, I know you know. Okay, we're gonna go bottoms. Like that, okay? Ready? You can do it. One, two, three. Yay! You did it, Jack! Good, good job! Good job, Jack. Jack Riley, okay. we're gonna say bye bye to Tazel. Are you ready? Can you give me Tazel? Five, four, three, Ow. two, one. Okay, give it to mommy, please. Good, Good boy. Job. I know it's hard, isn't it? Can you march back to mommy? March, 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 march. march. Welcome back. Um, a story that keeps unfolding in the news and has been ongoing now for four days. And I'll be honest with you, I have uh, struggled with how much time to spend on it. And it's gotten to the point where I just really said, we, we have to cover this today. Um, of course, many of you are aware of the fact that on Tuesday in Midland City, Alabama, that uh, a gentleman boarded a bus with a gun and asked to remove some children from the bus and the heroic bus driver put himself between the gentleman and the children and lost his life as a result of it and we were hearing lots of different reports of what happened and that the gentleman was able to grab two children subsequently one of the children got away and one had fainted and that he left with that child and took the child into a bunker and has been there ever since and the authorities know where they are and they've been talking to them through a PVC pipe um, and they've been able to get medication from the mother of the child to the child because they've been saying all week long there have been you know discrepancies but it is now widely being reported and so I do think we need to discuss it that um, while they are still keeping the child's full name under wraps they are reporting that the mother has disclosed that the child does have ADHD and an Asperger diagnosis and you know this is one of these things that when I first heard about this story I was completely horrified I really could not have been more horrified that this kind of thing is happening in our country that our children being safe has to be a top priority and uh, and my heart went out to the family of the bus driver at, who truly a heroic gentleman to put himself between uh, the children and the gunmen and so heroic that so many of the children had the the wherewithal and the strength to open the back door and for as many of them to get away as possible you know absolutely unspeakable and I have been including both the bus driver's family and the family of the child who has been held for four days in my prayers. And, you know, I just can't even imagine. I, I've been saying all week long, my, my goodness, I don't know how that mom is surviving this. I really don't. And not to just you know, to discount what the dad is going through, but as a mom, you know, I just think, what would I, I don't know how I could survive that. They would have to sedate me. And I don't think I would let them, I would need, I don't know what I would need to do, but, um, and then, of course, to hear that uh, that it appears that this child has Asperger's, which not to say that um, that if it wasn't a child with Asperger's that we wouldn't all be devastated because we were. But I think that those in our community understand that it makes it that much harder to uh, to realize what the child is going through because they maybe don't have the mechanism that another child might have. And I don't mean that to be an inconsiderate of, of what another other child will be going through but it's just that much more difficult and of course the reporting today in the AP that the child has been crying for his parents and that's just a very hard thing to hear um, 
and I hope that if you're a praying person that with me you will pray for this family and for our nation that this kind of thing not continue um, and that there is a quick and successful end to this so that this child can be reunited with his family um, and you know I do believe in the power of positive thought and maybe if we can all say a prayer for this family today that hopefully I, I, I know that they've because I keep saying why why can't they do something if you know where he is why can't you do something I know they're being cautious for the child's sake um, I know that they're waiting this this horrible person out um, and that hopefully w they can end this quickly and get this child back to safety as soon as possible but please pray with me for this family uh, we'll be back after these messages Skills is an online program that provides assessment curriculum positive behavior support planning for challenging behavior and progress tracking, and it does this all in one place. The skills assessment and curriculum addresses eight areas of development, which even includes advanced higher level areas, such as executive functions and cognition, which pretty much makes skills the only ABA-based set of curricula for teaching more complex skills, things like problem solving, planning, self-management, perspective taking, and even inferring and predicting others' private events. Skills is a four-step system. Step one is to add the child to your account. Step two is to start assessment. The skills assessment is the only ABA-based assessment with psychometric research demonstrating the language subscale to have excellent reliability. Every area of human functioning and typical child development from infancy to adolescence was researched, making the skills assessment the most comprehensive of its kind in the world, and we're quite proud of that. Skills is easy to use. Simply click Start Assessment and begin answering questions, or simply type in a keyword find specific activities to assess, and add activities to treatment. Step 3. Choose activities. Once you've completed the assessment, Skills selects from a pool of 4,000 activities categorized by age, level, and skill type to provide you with exactly those activities each child needs. Start by choosing a curriculum, then a lesson, and finally an activity. Click the information icon to view prerequisites, ages in which targets develop, examples, and IEP goals. Click the video icon to watch a short video. Once you've identified an activity you want to teach, adding activities to treatment is a snap. Step 4. Start treatment. Here you can access customizable activity lesson details, add your own customized targets and exemplars, and edit an activity status such as introducing or mastering it. You can even print handouts such as worksheets, tracking forms, visual aids, and other materials. Skills also offers multiple progress charts, mapping curriculum progress, lesson progress, and cumulative number of activities and targets mastered over time. The Skills Language Curriculum is categorized by verbal behavior type so that users can identify progress for verbal operants, such as echoics, mans, tax, and interverbals. Skills is one of the only programs that provides the ability to write behavior intervention plans, or BIPs, for challenging behavior. With just a few clicks, the outline of the behavior intervention plan is written for you and ready to be printed and implemented. You can learn more about Skills today and get started by visiting us at www.skillsforautism.com or you can call us at 877-975-4559. Skills. Progress starts here. Welcome back to Autism Live. I want to go back to the question that we were talking about before that I promised that we would get to. Um, the parent who wrote in and said that, you know, uh, let's talk about inclusion, about when is it good, when is it, you know, what are the good, uh, the good parts of it and the bad parts of it? And um, <clears throat> we started talking about it, and the parent has specified that this individual child has a one-on-one -on -one aid and is going to the resource room for a couple of hours, I think a day, to work on math and writing and and that uh, level of thing. And then they wrote back and said that, um, showing it now, my son goes to resource room to work on IEP goals, so every day the same goals taught in the same way by the same teacher one-on-one -on -one for two years now. Okay, so I said we would talk about this because sometimes, um, as a former teacher, I wanna say that people mean well 
mostly. Um, th of course, you're going to run into some people in the school system that are just there to get a paycheck, but honestly, um, those are few and far between because when people are just about a paycheck, they usually go and do something other than teaching. Uh, but there are, but, and, and what makes it worse is that the people that are actually there just for the paycheck are not very bright because they couldn't put together that, oh, if I want to just get a paycheck, I should go someplace else. Um, so it's, you know, when you do come across the ones that are there for not the right reason, they're really uh, bad on several different levels. But the vast majority of the people that you'll meet in the school system are, I think, in my opinion, opinion are well-intentioned. That doesn't mean that they're well-trained. That doesn't mean that they know what to do. And that is a bummer. But the good news is that we can help them. Uh, so here's my issue with, and again, we always like to preface that we don't want to give child specific advice because I can't possibly know everything that's going on in that resource room just from what you're saying to me. So we'll take everything with a grain of salt. But if we're working with the same teacher on the same goals day in, day out, over two years. I, my, my teacher antenna goes up and goes, where's the progress? Um, and if we're not seeing progress, it's time to change something, right? Uh, it's that thing about, you know, uh, if, you know, we can keep doing this, beating our heads against the wall forever, but if it's not getting it done, maybe we should look at doing something different. And it's not a bad thing as a parent to go in and ask the team and say, what is our plan for progress? To use those kinds of words to, first of all, in an IEP, it, they, they're supposed to have the IEP benchmarks and how often they measure it. And if they get to a point and the child has not met the goal, they are supposed to change something. And they're supposed to list reasons of why they didn't get to the goal and what they're going to do to change it. And if it's been two years that the child, I'm assuming that the benchmarks aren't being met if it's the same lessons, or is it that the lessons are kind of rotating into the next thing? In any case, um, if it's that the lessons are kind of rotating into the same thing, but the setting hasn't changed and the teacher hasn't changed, then maybe you want to talk about what is our plan for generalizing these skills and getting them back into the classroom. And I would use that term. What is our plan for generalizing these skills and getting them back into the classroom? And I would come in with a couple of goals that are specifically to that end. And you can do them yourself on skills, um, but you know, something that says along the lines of that, you know, uh, let's say the child's name is Bill, that Bill will be able to do this skill in, and there's always a place in, already in your IEP language that lists what setting, and I would ask to include it in the classroom. So even if they want to keep the same IEP goal, there's other things that you can change, like the location of where it's being taught and the person who's teaching it to them. And if the same person has been teaching the same IEP goals for two years and they're not making the benchmarks, it's time for a new teacher because uh, I don't know a good teacher who would be okay with that a good teacher would say let's try this uh, now it may be that you know you weren't able to write all of that to me and that they are trying different things but it's still not being effective that's nothing against the teacher when they're trying things and they still haven't found the thing great but shake it up shake it up and put it in a different place. Let's see if the child can't learn it um, in the classroom. Now, if it's that the class is on this goal and your child is on this goal and, the, and the, the school is saying, look, there's 30 kids in the classroom, the teacher can't teach two different lessons, the aide can, your child could be doing the lesson that they're doing in the resource room in the classroom with the aide supporting. And if the aide isn't qualified to, to help and facilitate that lesson, then I got some questions about that. But why can't the resource specialist come into the classroom and do that? And you will find that you know, and you may have already talked to them about this and they'll give you a whole rundown of why and I'll tell you what it comes down to is that there aren't enough bodies, which is a funding issue, which doesn't get to be the reason why they refuse to do, to teach the IEP goals. They don't get to hide behind that. Um, and you can push and say, why? 
And that's all really all you basically have to do, but say it in writing. Why can't the resource specialist come in and work on this in the classroom? And they'll say, well, you know, blah, 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 blah. But there's no good answer for it. It all goes back to funding. If they say there's no room, we don't have a desk, then your response is, so we're saying that it would be ideal to do that, but you don't have the funding to get a desk. If I find a desk that my child can be in the classroom but set over here, can we do that? Can we use my child's desk? Can we, you know, and they say, well, then the resource specialist has to be with the other kids in the classroom. Then, you know, are we saying that we don't have the funding for another person to be in the place where we think that it would be workable for my child? You know, because it all comes back to funding and you really want to put their fire, to, their feet to the fire with it. And I would encourage you to have a tape recorder running because if you can catch them on the tape recorder saying we don't have the funding for it, it's pretty much done. You won. Uh, you might have to lawyer up, but you won. And, and the school will realize it at some point that you got them to say that into a, a tape recorder and you will have won. I know that funding is difficult and that, you know, we hate to be in a position where we're being contentious with school districts, uh, but the reality is, is that they have a responsibility to look at our individual children and to provide what is right for them, to have them progress, to meet their IEP goals, and to eventually be ready to go out into the world. And if they don't know how to get it done, as I said before, we need to help them to figure that out. We don't have to be mean about it, we don't have to be nasty about it, but the fact remains, um, what they're doing isn't working. And here's the other thing that I also like to say to myself as a parent. Uh, if I don't suit up and show up and make sure that I'm clear about what my child deserves, who will, and that when I suit up and show up for my child, I feel better about myself. I feel bad sometimes because I feel like the people at school hate me, but I'm willing to take that on, and really they don't. I think a lot of times they're happy that you spoke up because they learned something, and then when you're with the right people, it, it gets uh, shared down the road with another child. And so it's a gift that keeps giving, a gift you give yourself, a gift you give your child, a gift you give your child's teacher, a gift you give your child's class. And every single child who comes along after your child and meets with that same teacher and those same kids and that same resource teacher will benefit from it. So truly, the gift that keeps on giving. I've shared that I, you know, stepped up a little bit this last year at the IEP and said, here are some goals in IEP language for my child on the playground because I just didn't think that that was happening um, and we were losing ground. And uh, I expected for to meet with resistance. Instead, I was met with, oh, okay, we'll get a resource, uh, not a resource, a recreation therapist to come and evaluate him. They came and evaluated him and said he does qualify for and needs some help and support and that she would come and consult and help the teacher and help everybody who's involved with him and work on. And I'm hearing back that it's great for his entire class that other kids that hadn't been identified as having a problem are learning as a result of this. So don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to be helpful to more people uh, than just your child, but first and foremost, foremost helping your child. Um, and um, and they just wrote in and said, awesome advice, Shannon. I knew I could count on you. Well, I don't know about that because it's, you're going to have to, you know, see how it works out and who you meet with resistance with and don't be afraid to write back. But um, you said, uh, how is Jem doing in full inclusion now? And I will tell you, it depends on the day. Um, but I would never, he's doing so well, I would never consider having him be someplace else. I do see that in, even it started last year at the end of third grade and it's in fourth grade right now that the kids are tough. <sighs> They're tough. And that he only has to do something small and there's a little ripple amongst the cool kids. Uh, Cause I'm in their classroom now working on this theater project and I kind of see what the ins and outs of it. And man, I gotta tell you, it's given me a little bit of pause cause kids are mean. And I've been meeting with experts here about it and we'll talk about it more on the show, but coming to this realization that 
There's a whole lot of things I can be doing and that I'm working on with him to get him shored up and, and so that he's less likely to be ostracized and less likely to be picked on. But I'm also seeing, because there's lots of completely neurotypical kids um, that go to school and kids are mean to them. And, and we can get our kids as ready as possible, but kids are going to be mean. And then I hear from other parents who say that they've made the choice to shelter their children a little bit and put them in different learning situations, not to put them in a resource situation, but to send them to a, you know, like a charter school or a private school where it's a little bit more specialized and this, the class size is a little bit smaller. It's scaring me because I have no idea how people pay for that. Um, but I, I'm beginning to understand why they're just mean little buggers. <laughs> mean little bars. I hate to laugh because, but you know why I'm laughing? Because I know these kids and they're not bad kids. Uh, they just don't quite get that their actions have really long reaching things. I mean, I don't think, uh, that they realize, uh, and of course I'm trying to be a force for change with that too. And I haven't quite figured that out, but if I do, I'll let you know about it, but it's, it's rough. It is rough. It's not easy, especially in this age range. And I'm a little concerned about the junior high thing. But all the experts, they come in and they say to us, you know, what's really first and foremost, making sure that we, you know, are present in this and, and that we give our kids all the skills and buddies, good friends who will stick up for them. And I'm seeing that that is the thing that really makes them Teflon is that they've got other kids around them and that that's a good place to put your energy. And I'm thinking of starting uh, a program at our school. I'm about to put together a proposal for a buddy program. They already have something, but it's not quite what I'm looking for. Um, so, you know, uh, that's where I'm at. But I still think that him being included with the other kids, because academically and socially, really super duper important for my kid. And again, all of our kids are different. Um, and somebody else or that same person wrote in, how often do you observe in the classroom? And, um, you know, I, I want to be 100% uh, uh, clear that I don't get a chance to observe in the classroom ever. <laughs> like, I and I have to in my school district, if I want an expert to come and observe my child, I have to give them written notice. They have to give approval on the day and the time. I think they're limited to an hour and they have to be accompanied by a administrator from district. Um, and I am never given the opportunity to just come and observe. However, I have the opportunity to go and participate and be of support and be in the classroom as a volunteer, which is the same thing as observing, right? <laughs> you know, there's more than one way to do things. And, um, Oh, I like this. Sounds like a wonderful new show, The Buddy Show, uh, and teach us how to do the same. Well, and maybe we, maybe that's what we need to do. Good idea. Um, but in any case, I, uh, when my son was in kindergarten and my work situation, uh, because of the choices that we made allowed for it, that I went into the classroom twice a week for at least an hour and a half each time, uh, which was a lot. And I don't know that I would recommend that for anybody else. And I don't know that that was the best thing for my child because he got really used to me being there. Um, but I got to see everything that happened and he had the best kindergarten teacher. Oh my goodness. And I loved working with the kids. Um, I really miss teaching and being in the classroom, but, um, I don't know that that was, I think that going and volunteering, if you can find half hour, 45 minutes, or even an hour to go once a week to volunteer in your child's classroom, I think the child, it's just enough that the child doesn't get used to it. It's something that the teacher really appreciates. You get to know the other kids. And I was saying the other day, they, when you show compassion to the other kids, they show compassion to your kid. It's a really exciting little 
triangle of compassion, um, that they will treat your kid better. They view your child as a real person who has a mom. I don't know what there is about that, but I have seen it in, and I've seen it in my child. I've seen it in other kids' children. So if you have the time, if you don't, as we were saying the other day, you know, talk to the other kids at the gate. Um, but there is something great about being able to see firsthand while you're there and not just observe, but to interact with the kids and kind of get the feel for, you know, who's the kid and you see them in a full 360 degree view the kid that you think has been a little bit rough on your kid and then you see this is a kid who's struggling who is having some problems of their own and then your compassion kicks in and I think you're better at addressing it I'm working on that right now there's been a kid in particular that I see has not been the kid on my radar right different kid who kind of you know, says things to other kids who then say something to my child, and I was thinking it was the other kids and didn't, wasn't really understanding. I'm seeing that there's one kid that's kind of ringleading it, and I'm, I'm trying during my time in the classroom to spend a little extra time with that kid and show some extra compassion, hoping that I'm going to get to the point where I can say to him, you know, thank you for being so good and so supportive with my kid. Uh, you know, because we thank people for the, for the behavior that we're wanting to see. And sometimes it does the trick. Because uh, I think this kid needs a little, uh, a little attention. I don't know. We'll see. Can't hurt right? Uh, hopefully it'll move the dial in a little different direction. But in any case, right now I am in my child's classroom one hour a week. Um, and then there's an additional hour that I am with his class and two other classes. So a total of two hours right now, and that's really intensive for me. And I wouldn't want it to be any more than that. And it's just a brief period of time while I'm directing this project. So but I like this idea of the buddy show. This is kind of very exciting. So let's let's do on that and see what we can't come up with. In any case, we have to take a break. And as we go to break, I want to re-show at least one of the interview segments that we did with Temple Grand. And there are two that we're showing right now. There are many more that are coming because uh, we're going to show both of the clips that we've done before. But we're going to show one. Then we're going to come back and we're going to have the drawing. We are going to pick who gets the cow. Let's do the cow first. And then we'll show the other interview clip and then we'll come back and we'll draw for the book. All right, so take a look. This is the amazing Temple Grandin. What do you think about ABA treatment? ABA is the one that's documented, but I think that's what I think is important with little kids, the intensity. If this kid's two, three, and four years old, he needs 20 or 30 hours a week of intensive early intervention, working one-to-one -one with an effective teacher. Mm -hmm. And an effective teacher knows kind of how just hard to push, because you've got to stretch these kids. Mm -hmm. You don't stretch them somewhere, they don't advance. Mm -hmm. You push them on them too hard, they go into sensory shutdown. The worst thing you could do with an autistic two-year-old is to do nothing with them and just let them sit there rocking. And when I was very young at two and a half, ABA type things were used on me but it wasn't called ABA in that day. Right. You know, my teacher would hold up a cup and she'd speak slowly. You've got to speak slowly to these kids because there's auditory processing problems. So you say cup, and then I'd say cup, and, and the teacher would praise me. You know, that's very similar to ABA. You know, ABA in its, um, you know, original form is a little kid's program. The whole idea is you're trying to get language jump-started. And I like the more flexible kinds of ABA. You've got different levels of kids. Mm -hmm. um, once, I mean, I had ABA type stuff when I was young, but mm -hmm. then after I pulled out of it, I didn't have to go through elaborate things of getting ready for school. I still have this habit now today. I lay my clothes out the night before that I'm going to wear, mm -hmm. so when I'm sleepy, I can just get them on. And then you have other individuals where they've got to do very structured, you know, uh, you know, breaking down the task analysis. Yeah. This is where after you get out of the little kids and you get them talking, they kind of diverge into yeah. different levels of functioning. And a type of ABA program that'd be suitable for a very severe kid would not be something you'd want to do with a mild Asperger kid because you're going to bore them to death and make them hate school. Absolutely. 
There she is, Temple Grandin. She signed the cow. She came in and said, what's with the cattle? Right out of, out of the side of her mouth, what's with the cattle? And she was smiling. And then she signed them. I've got it upside down. There it is, Temple Grandin up onto the udder. There was a whole discussion, can I tell you, about that, you know, she wanted her her signature to be big enough that you could see it. And, and it was hard because, you know, this is a pretty detailed cow. There's veins on the bottom that stick up and little uh, marks for the hair on it then uh, and so she uh, the first time she had difficulty but then she started writing up onto the other and she said that works so much better so you got you're getting one of the good ones where she signed it up onto the other uh, a really fabulous thing the cow and so I'm gonna reach in here and pull out all right, I've got one. Okay, it is Cindy Gonyer. Cindy, you are now the proud owner of the cow. We're going to be in touch with you via your um, email address, and we'll get this cow out to you. We'd love to have a picture of you with the cow to post on our Facebook. All right, we still have the book that has the signature to give away. We're going to show the other interview piece that we've been showing of Temple, reminding you that these are just little pieces of what we have and that we'll, we'll have many more. I'm just going to stir these around, so take a look. This is the other interview we been showing with Temple and we're going to come back and give away the book. Stick with us. Hi, we're here with Temple Grandin and we're going to be asking her some of your questions that you guys have written into us. First of all, Temple, I want to thank you for being with us here today. No, it's good and to answer. be here. This is a question that I want to know. When you went to the Emmys and you went to all these different events and you were there in your wonderful shirt, was there anybody who tried to talk you into wearing something else or did they just understand that you needed to be who you were? Well, I think being eccentric is just fine. I dressed eccentric at the um, Emmys. Mm -hmm. Eccentric's fine. Being a filthy slob is not fine. Mm -hmm. Let's look at the latest Mars rover. You got the Mohawk guy that's the head of the expedition. You got the Elvis guy yeah. that figured out how to land on the moon and he wears Elvis outfits. <laughs> I think that's just fine. But you can't be a rude, filthy, dirty slob. That's the thing where draw the line. Eccentric's fine. I remember a guy who was on the spectrum and he taught astronomy in a local college. And he had beautiful astronomy t-shirts and he had long hair with a ponytail this long. And I said to him, don't let anybody cut your ponytail off. You know, wear it with pride, but it must be washed and it must be clean there you and go. neat. Love it. Did they try to talk you into wearing a dress, or they they? Knew oh no, would... nobody knew I would wear a dress. <laughs> I, I got too much of a farmer tan and would just look just terrible. I'm no, you're not going to get me in an evening gown. I did buy some new black pants. I'm going to wear okay. it tonight. Well, I thought you looked great. I well, I want to let you know about the shirt award of the Emmys. Yeah. That was a Ralph Lauren oh, shirt. There okay, you go. fashion snubs. <laughs> and that was a gift from my sister for Christmas. I, can I just say, I just loved when she got tickled about things. It was just so fun. Because uh, there were so many moments, I mean, we were there to talk about autism, and she really is the famous, the most famous person in the world with autism. Um, you know, nobody can argue with that. And, and um, but can I tell you how many times that I sat with her, there with her when I really wouldn't have realized that, that there were just these wonderful moments, and, and I thought, okay, I know. I know, she has a diagnosis, but, um, but it was just fun to be sitting around talking with her. So, so exciting. Um, okay, it is time. Here's the book, there's the signature. Thinking in Pictures, My Life with Autism by Temple Grandin, signed by her. You gotta love that. Okay, I've got a piece of paper from the bottom here. Oopsie, oopsie, oopsie. And so, this goes to Susan Spann. Susan Spann, you are now the proud owner of the book signed by Temple Grandin. Very, very exciting. Congratulations to you. We will email you. Uh, and we, before the break, uh, before that interview, we said that Cindy Gonyer is the proud owner of the cow. So thrilled. We'll be emailing you and getting these out. In, uh, get, we'll need to get your actual addresses, and then we will get them out in the mail to you. For those of you who didn't win, I, I'm sorry, but we'll have other things coming up, um, and you'll get the free newsletter, and uh, we appreciate your participation. So, 
uh, stay tuned because we're giving away a lot more stuff that is on the newsletter that'll be coming out to you in the next couple of days. Let's take another short break and we'll come back. We have a special announcement, uh, something that was made public this morning. And, you know, from time to time, we thank people and, and give them our sort of virtual Autism Live Autism Award. We've got some exciting news of some people who got together and did something really cool. Stick with us. Welcome back. For the month of February, I thought it'd be a great idea to work on an activity that would help your kiddos identify and label emotions. And to help me out today is my good friend, Jamie. Hey, Suzanne. Hey there, Jamie. Hey, how can I help? Well, the way you can help me out is that because you're a sock puppet, you can do things with your face that I cannot do. No way. Totally. The way you can do it is that, you know, you have interchangeable features, which means you can make super exaggerated faces which makes it easier for kiddos to identify them and to label them. Uh-huh. Hey, I have a favor to ask you. Yeah? Can you help us out and show us some of your faces you can make? Of course! Here we go! Ooh, you look super mad. I was super mad. Can you show us another one? Sure. Ooh, you look super sad. I was super sad. All right, can you show us one more? One more. All right. You look super excited. I was super excited. I am too. You know why? Because I really want to show everyone how to make a little buddy like you. So hey. let's get started. The materials you'll be needing are googly eyes, felt, a hot glue gun, imagination, scissors, Velcro, some heavy cardstock, and a clean sock. All right, let's get to it. So the first thing you wanna do is you're gonna grab your sock. Hopefully it's not dirty and used. It's a clean one. And what you're gonna do is that you're gonna take your sock, fold it in half like so, and then you're gonna take your scissors and cut down. The reason we're doing this is that we're gonna make an area for the mouth. Um, the next thing you wanna do is you wanna trim the inside a little bit because if you don't, it's going to have an overbite. So I'm just going to take my scissors and just trim a little bit off, not much. Now that this guy is ready, I'm going to take a hard card stock or note card or whatever you have that's a piece of paper. I'm going to fold it in half and what I'm going to do with this is going to be the inside of its mouth, the kind of reinforcement so you are able to move its mouth around. So I'm going to just cut it into an oval. And don't worry, if it's a little too big, you can always trim it. With this sock puppet project, the materials we're using, like the hot glue, is not something for children. So this is something you're going to be doing by yourself and then asking your child to join in once the puppet is ready to go. All right, now that I got that out of the way, let's start gluing. I'm going to take my hot glue gun and I'm going to glue it on the paper. Okay, once I have that, I'm going to put that in the inside of its mouth and then I'm going to take the sock and then pull it over the edge and cover it the glue. All right, so now that I have the bottom part done, I'm gonna do the same thing to the top. So now that we have this part assembled, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a piece of felt and we're gonna cover this area so you don't see all the scraggly stuff. So I have my piece of felt right here. I'm gonna fold it in half and I'm just gonna cut out a similar oval shape. And again, don't worry if it's too big. You can always trim it after we glue it on. I'm gonna glue it inside. All right, now we got pretty much the base of the sock puppet. He's got a moving mouth, but wait, he's got no features. We gotta help him out with that. So what I'm gonna do is I have these pieces of Velcro that I bought that are already sticky on the back, which makes my life a lot easier. And I'm gonna peel this off and place it where I want his eyes. So one there, and one there. And then I'm also gonna put them also along his mouth. And then if you want to get fancy, you can put some for his eyebrows as well. So now that I have this, we should be making some features for him. I'm alive! Alive! <laughs> I had a great time with my buddy Jamie, and I hope you did too. Until next time, bye! Bye! <laughs> and don't forget to send us your photos at facebook.com slash autism live. Can you see me? Can you see me flying? by your side.
Okay, how fun was that? I just sat here and life, laughed myself sideways, and somebody already wrote in and said, how exciting to see a real puppet show on your show. I can share this with my son. He'll love it. Maybe a new idea for a future segment, puppet show or animation to teach a skill to our kids. Can I tell you? We're already working on that. Uh, great minds think alike. And everybody got so excited about doing the puppets that uh, actually that was one of the things that most recently got discussed. So that's in the works. It'll be a while before, you know, because it's just in the, in the beginning stages. But I'm glad that I can say that a viewer thought this was a good idea too. Uh, what a great, great project. We love when Suzanne, that's our new February Smarty, so we'll be showing that. And you can find that on our Facebook page. And I said while we were watching this, Suzanne is especially good with crafts. She's a wizard. I'm a little bit more clumsy. And if you're like me, when you're doing the part where you're gluing and pulling the sock over the mouth, have that glass of cold water next to you so that when you burn your finger, what you do immediately with hot glue, stick your finger in so that it doesn't burn you horribly. And again, as Suzanne said, don't be doing that part with your child. Just do that part yourself and, and the hot glue part and then bring your child in. But if you're like me and you burn yourself frequently with hot glue, have that glass of cold water, stick the hand in, it hardens the glue instantly and it stops the burn. It's uh, essential in my household. But fabulous, fabulous new craft. And so we completely love that. Uh, and I got so busy watching that that I did not bring up on my screen what I was supposed to bring up on my screen. Uh, and there you have it. Uh, but in any case, I wanted to, and I'm, so I'm going to take a second to go back and bring it up on my screen. And um, every once in a while on the show, you know, we talk about things that are hard and we have this, this episode and and it's good to talk about the things that are fabulous and when people are doing really remarkable things too and it was reported yesterday in the Wall Street Journal, uh, Journal, and it was officially acknowledged today that a group of people decided that they wanted to do something remarkable. And um, so a, a couple of different families united to find a way, we all talk about this, about what are we gonna do to help our kids and help our adults uh, with autism to get jobs and to get education. And so we have to give a big shout out to a couple of, of different people. Michael. Lillard, who is the chief investment offer for Prudential Fixed Income. He is also the father of two teenage boys who are on the autism spectrum. And he got together with his wife and with a gentleman named Mel Karmazin, who is a philanthropist and, a, and the former chief executive uh, of Sirius XM Radio. And uh, Mr. Karmazin's daughter, Dina Karmazin Elkins, they all got together and they were able to make a combined gift of 1.5 million million, I said million, dollars to Rutgers University and the State University of New Jersey in order to, and they specified for them to fund a chair position in adult autism at the Graduate School of Applied and Professional Psychology. And the gift was announced today. Um, and Mr. Lillard said that the gift was born from the need to address the limited services and opportunities for the rapidly growing population of children with autism. Uh, this endowed professorship will cover research, practice, and the training of professionals who work with adults with autism. Uh, and, and one of the biggest challenges that he cited was getting a job that this is a place where we know that our kids need support. And his quote was, all parents want their job, their, their kids, excuse me, to be able to grow up and to have a productive work environment, to have a job. That's certainly a dream of ours. And, um, Mr. Karmazin, who also and his daughter also uh, donated, he has a grandson who was diagnosed at the age of two. And, um, and he felt that it was necessary for him to participate in some way too. And he is an executive committee board member of Autism Speaks. Um, and his daughter, uh, Mrs. Carmazin Elkin, serves as the executive director of the Princeton base of a of his Princeton based 
foundation. Um, so an amazing, amazing thing for these two families to get together and to have made this tremendous, tremendous donation, $1.5 million, that certainly is going to change things for the better. So we want to salute them and say how remarkable. We've been talking about compassion and action. Here it is. And not all of us have the $1.5 million to, to give, but if you do, uh, how nice is that that they did? I just find that really remarkable. Um, and their hope is that the work at Rutgers will serve as a prototype for other universities so that it will have far-reaching effects for all of our children. Congratulations to these two families and to all of us. Nice work. We're going to take a break and come back to finish out the show. Stick with us. Monica Holloway is a critically acclaimed author, speaker, and activist. She is also an autism mom. Her son, Wills, was diagnosed with autism at the age of three. Now, at the age of 15, Wills is a high school freshman attending a mainstream school. I'm in a brand new school. I'm in a great school that I love, and I'm really happy there. I made friends pretty quickly on the first day, uh -huh. and something interesting happened to me on the first day. Tell me. We were doing an art project with um, fabric markers, and there was a little label on it that said, squeeze for best results. Okay. And so I squeezed it and exploded <laughs> all over the people at my table. Oh no! And we were all covered in little blue dots. I asked Wills how he describes autism to people. I say that I have Asperger's syndrome, which is a slight form of autism. It doesn't make you any different. It really doesn't. It's just it's just there and it just kind of makes you who you are. I asked Wills what he thought of the Sandy Hook shooter's actions being linked to autism. Please, please just don't don't be scared of autism. If, you, if somebody has autism, don't be scared of them. Chances are they're not violent. They're just like you or me. Monica is a proud mom with good cause. I asked her to describe Wills in five words. Generous, curious, funny, sensitive, loving. We had a chance to talk about the Sandy Hook massacre and how Monica heard the news. On Friday, when it happened, when the shooting happened in Connecticut, I was in my car and uh, my husband Michael called to tell me what had happened. And I was in a state of shock, as I think we all were, but that many children. And I felt, I guess, a mind can't take in that kind of information uh, without feeling nauseous. I, I felt it go from here all the way down my body. I started calling everybody I knew to tell them I loved them and um, I was thinking about them and I just wanted to be with the people that I knew. I started hearing more and more um, information come on the news about this shooter having Asperger's or being autistic. And then I started hearing things about, um, well, does autism cause violence? And I started, to, I was in a whole other level of shock. Never in a million years would I think that somebody might associate us and my son's face with the face of violence just because he has Asperger's. And I've seen bad days and good days and that's what kills me is like there was not a day bad enough to ever make me think that he or any of his friends could ever be violent. The only thing that made me even feel a little bit better to do something to help educate. And so we've started a campaign on my Facebook page, Cowboy and Wills, it's called I Am the Face of Autism. And please post a picture of yourself. It can be your child, your friend with autism. Let's put these beautiful faces of these people with autism on to wipe out the face of this murderer. Let's put our faces in front of his. Welcome back. I promised you that we would do a funding tip and we want to make sure we get to it because we usually do that on Friday. It's a good time to do a funding tip because you can think about it and stew about it over the weekend. Uh, in particular this week I want to talk about fundraising and how important it is that you get into a headspace where you're okay with raising funds. Now having said that, if, you're, if you feel funny about raising funds for your individual child, and I know a lot of people that do, I want to remind 
remind you that there are lots of other ways that you can raise funds for autism and that that's a really important thing to do. Autism Care and Treatment today, Nancy comes in on a weekly basis and says whatever, that there is no amount that's too small. That you can, you personally can donate as small as a dollar um, and that if you want to do a fundraiser for them, that they'll take a dollar. If you wanted to do, say, a lemonade stand and you go down to the street corner with your child and take all precautions to make sure that they're safe, you know, where cars are moving around, but you do a lemonade stand and if you make $12 and send it off to uh, Autism Care and Treatment Today, it does make a difference. It literally makes a big difference. Uh, when I hear from families who are trying to be able to buy skills on a monthly basis, which is, I believe, a $75 a month and for some people, and I, can I tell you, uh, there were a lot of years when I would not have been able to have afforded that and I would have needed help to afford that. And when you think about the difference that that $12 can make and that if a few people did a lemonade stand, that means that somebody gets skills for a month. It's There's no amount that's too small. So, and, and that's good practice for our kids too, to, not only is it good for us to do something for somebody else, but to have our kids do something for somebody else. And we talk about those job skills where better to start than doing a lemonade stand down at the corner one day and to see what it is and learn customer service and, and to try all those things. It has to be the right thing for the right child and maybe a lemonade stand isn't the thing for your child at this mo moment in time, but is there something? We know families that have done many, many, you know, bake sale or making pins um, and making pin kits. I've talked about that before on the show. So think about what you want to do. Now I want to talk specifically to the parents who are wanting to raise funds for their individual child. Um, because there's something, you know, when you think of that wish list, right? And I think all of us have that running somewhere in the back of our brains, the list of things about if I had the money, here's what I would do for my kid. And it may be that you're looking to get a, a more airtight diagnosis so that you can go to the school and have a better grounds to fight for your child to have the one-on-one -on -one aid. It may be that you want to go to a doctor and have the really expensive blood panels done to see beyond the, the run-of-the-mill blood panel that they do on kids to see if there's some other stuff going on for your child. Maybe you want to have your child go to a neurologist so that you can see if they're having um, seizures at a very small level while they're sleeping. You know, the list goes on and on. What's on the wish list? Is it having an iPad? Is it all of those things? And of course, you can apply for a grant to Autism Care and Treatment today. And if you're skittish about having a fundraiser for yourself, I encourage you to do that. Apply for a grant from ACT today. And if you feel guilty about that, which you don't need to, do a lemonade stand or do something else to raise money for ACT today. Now, now there are some families though that are less skittish and say, you know what, I I, I know the thing I want to do to help my child and I believe that I could do it, uh, I just don't know how to do it. And there are lots of different ways that you can do a fundraiser and I have said that on March 1st I'm going to shave my head. If there's a way that I can tie in and make that for work for your fundraiser, you can say, this this woman is doing a fundraiser and you know we're raising funds for our, and she will do X, Y, and Z if you'll donate. I'll, tell me what it is as long as it doesn't hurt me and it's not permanent, I'll be happy to help you out. Um, I will tell you honestly that we did fundraisers when our son uh, was diagnosed with autism the first time that, well, we we did one fundraiser and then another a friend did another fundraiser for us. And the first time it was so that we could take him to do the original panel for biomedical. <clears throat> at that time, I think it's a lot less expensive now, but at that time it was $2,000 to get all of the, the medical stuff so that we would know how to begin to treat what was going on with him on the inside. Two grand. And I sure didn't have it. My husband sure didn't have it. And um, and I was working less than before so that I could be present um, to help our child and for him to be able to get ABA. So we thought outside the box and we did a fundraiser. We know a lot of people who are in the entertainment business and are, and are talented and, and should be more well-known to all, uh, people. So we uh, made a, an arrangement with a restaurant. They... Uh, served dinner so people had to eat something and they had to pay for that separately but then we auctioned things off and they got entertainment and um, we were able to raise that two thousand dollars it was really amazing and I've said before on the show I've never felt more uh, 
connected to my friends and so many people, I expected to feel skittish about it and feel like, oh, I'm so pathetic that I got to do this. But people came up and said, thank you so much for doing this because we haven't known how to help you. And so I want to encourage you guys to think in terms of that and think outside the box. What do you have? Is there something you have that you could raffle or a friend who has a business that's willing to give you something to raffle off? Don't be afraid to have a fundraiser. And if there's a way that I can help you by using my bald head, please let me know and let's work on it together because we can do this as a fundraiser for 300 people at the same time, but don't shortchange your child by not participating in that kind of thing and by not allowing the, uh, the others around you, they will feel good. If it's only a dollar, if that's what they have to give, they will feel good in giving it to you, truly. That, uh, that is the way that kind of thing works. So I hope you'll take us at our, our word. I hope that you will somehow find a way be a part of fundraising. And by the way, we just talked about Autism Speaks. If you want to walk in there, walk and raise funds in that way. We've been hearing all week long about some of the different things that they do with funds. Another great thing, and there are so many organizations that are out there that you could donate. And remember that it isn't just about funds. Sometimes it's about donating time. If you don't have the funds and you're skittish about fundraising, how about finding some time for you and your child? Take your child with, we've heard how important it is to have our kids volunteer, helps them with job skills. So, uh, uh, all right, we're going to take a quick break, come back, and hopefully have a second to look at things that you guys wrote into the question of the day. But the week is ending, and we'll talk about next week, too. Stick with us. Hi, I'm Bryce Myler, and I'm the Contracts Director for the Center for Autism and Related Disorders. I've been here for about five years. CARD has several employees with many years of insurance experience, uh, dealing with insurance, dealing with pre-authorizations, dealing with discovering whether there's coverage or not. So we have more experience than any ABA provider that I've ever come across. So for, for a prospective client, somebody that may be interested in you know ABA therapy and what CARD has to offer, we have a special 800 number um, and you call that number. They will talk to you about what we have to offer, uh, how ABA works, he'll ask you for the front and back of your ID card and then we check to see if you do or do not have coverage. If you have coverage for ABA therapy, we try to do whatever we can to set it up where we can bill for you and you don't have to fight with the insurance company every month to get your claims paid. For California residents, we recently did a series of insurance trainings all over the state and you can click on the link below to watch pretty much the full presentation. It has a lot of information how you can get your insurance company to, to comply with what they're supposed to do. Uh, understanding the networks and many other um, valuable pieces of information. Welcome back. We are uh, able to see some of our stuff on Facebook that you guys have written in for the question of the day. Our question was, how are you going to show compassion today? And someone said that they're going to pray for the family in Alabama. I'm right there with you. Let's all pray for them. Uh, someone else said, uh, I say many prayers for families, including my son. Someone else who said uh, that they're going to take care of their severe autistic 23-year-old son. It's wonderful. Someone else says, taking some dog tags I designed and engraved to a local business where a friend who is fighting breast cancer works. They are all going to wear these dog tags to support her and her fight. How fabulous. How fabulous. Another person says, I will advocate. Bless you. Somebody else says, I'm not going to criticize my husband, uh, how my husband does things and thank him for helping me. Oh, air hugs. <laughs> because I have to remember that too. It's all too easy for me to go, oh, I wish you'd done it this, this way, and instead just thanking him, that stuff that Evelyn Gould talks about on the show. Catch them doing something good and praise them for it, and don't tell them they could have done it another way. Uh, another person who says, since compassion usually is shown at random times, it would be hard to say what I will do today to show compassion. If the opportunity presents itself, I will indeed show it. I can tell you, though, I won't be hugging a lion or nor a zebra. Okay, I don't know what. 
Oh, because we put we put a photo. Uh, I I didn't see the photo. All right. Uh, okay. And somebody else said that the picture reminds them of Madagascar. Oh, okay. Sometimes our picture is very funny, but we don't criticize the person who posted because he's doing such a good job of posting it for us. Right. <laughs> so. Um, uh, okay, and somebody else says, I'm sorry to be a downer, but I can't believe that the lion is hugging the zebra. <laughs> All right. Uh, okay, you guys are talking about the uh, the zebra and all this. Uh, okay. Uh, okay, somebody else says that at the right moment, the right time thing, um, uh, I'm, I believe in never leaving someone mad. Okay, that, so I think that that's what they're talking about, that they're not going to leave somebody mad. Uh, all right. So the question was, what, can, what are you going to do today to show compassion? And it's a good question. We got a little sidetracked on the lion and the zebra. And uh, that's okay. It's okay. We can all get sidetracked by things. But again, how are we going to show compassion? And it could be just to show compassion towards ourselves. It's a good question to wake up every morning and ask ourselves, how, how can I do something nice for me today? How can I be gentle with myself today? How how can what can I do today that I really will enjoy and Emily's starting to cycle through some of the different ways that you can get in touch with us and I hope that as the weekend comes that you find some time for yourself Temple Grandin said to me Shannon it's important that you find things to do that have nothing to do with autism I'm taking her at her word and my husband are going and I are going on a date tomorrow I have a babysitter I don't know how that happened. It's usually so difficult, but I do. I have a babysitter, and my husband and I are going to go out. I'll post a picture on Facebook tomorrow so that you can see what we look like dressed up and going out. I'm very excited about that, and I hope that you find time over the weekend. And by the way, we have a bunch of things planned to do with our son, not the least of which is going to Home Depot tomorrow morning to do the craft. I'm sure it'll be Valentine-y, and it might be a gift for Mom. Um, you never know. I have a... Um, a jewelry box that he made for me one year that's really sweet and I open it up and it and it plays music it's very cute so go to Home Depot in the morning it's free you gotta love free and find something fun to do with your kids with your significant other over the weekend and with yourself do something good for yourself something that's fun for yourself we'll be back on Monday Monday we start a whole new week uh, and our topic next week I'm just gonna give you a heads up is autism research so we're gonna be talking about that a lot and dr. Jonathan Tarbox is going to be with us on Monday instead of Friday of next week because we're talking about autism research and a whole lot of really exciting people to join us next week. You're really going to be very interested in it. Uh, but until then, we hope that you will give your kiddos a hug from me. Bye-bye for now. We'll see you on Monday.